<laughs> it did? That's a scarier thing. It shouldn't have done that. Hmm. Yes, it actually is. Thank you. <laughs> it's, if you needed any proof of that up till now, you have not been paying attention. All right. Now I am going to pray again. I, I was considering that the prayer until this all happened. So, Lord Jesus, one, I, you know where my phone is. And if I ran over it or what I've done, I don't even know. So, I uh, just... That would be helpful to have back. But um, what I really need, obviously, is the Holy Spirit. It was so funny, God. Oh, you're so funny. <laughs> uh, you know, Lord, that I was even thinking to myself, I'd better read this note for note because I just feel like it's so important. And I was going to pull those notes up and read them off, and I guess that's not the way this is going to roll, is it? So I just pray that you would fill in all gaps, Jesus. I didn't, as you laid this out to me so fast and furious, I just typed away and I wanted to have this in front of me. So the word's in front of me and your Holy Spirit's in the room as always. So we would just ask for you to speak in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, well, that's another large print Bible. I now have three, but I have the power of a trifecta of Bibles on my stand, but no phone. That's just hysterical. I can't figure out. I've never done that before. Well, I'm going to put this power stack right here, and, uh, and let's try. Okay, start the live stream. I know it's already running. Just, uh, just you know, can you clip that? Give me the title. <laughs> Ever, <laughs> ever completely ignore God's direction and just go your own way? That's legit the title for today's message. So funny. Christy, you must be enjoying this more than anyone after what I did to you on Wednesday night. Oh, she's raising her hands to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I, I set her up inadvertently on Wednesday night. Now, the joke's on me. Acts 27. We'll read it first. I'm going to read it straight through. I really legi legitimately am. When it was decided that we had sailed for Italy, they proceeded... Yeah. They proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an uh, Adramidian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to the sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day, we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there, we put out to sea and we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and he put us aboard it. When we, sailed, when we had sailed slowly meaning with difficulty, and had a good many days, and with difficulty arrived at Snidus. Since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, the island, of Salmon. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, I mean, this is in October, and it's, they're really at the same time we are in our calendar right now. That's what's going on in Acts, and that is not sailing time. From, from September to November, super-duper bad, very dangerous, and after November, impossible. No one even attempts it. So they're really in the danger zone right now, and they shouldn't have started this trip, and that's going to become evident so fast. That's why they're having so much difficulty against the northeast wind. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the last, uh, the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. And he said to them, Men, 
I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only to the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. When a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they'd attain their purpose, they weighed anchor and they began sailing along Crete close inshore. Verse 14. But before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called, mine calls it the northeaster in this version, I don't even know what that word is, Uriquillo? And when the ship was caught in it and we couldn't face the wind, we gave way to it and we let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. And after they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship. And fearing that they might run aground on the shadows of Surti, they let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo, like throwing it overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Well, just a note, I just, can you take up that picture that I got there? Um that I sent in, just a, just a flash to that. That's, you know, you recognize that on a ship, right? You've seen that. Now, none of us that aren't, you know, nautical would even know how to operate any of that stuff, but we do get what it does. You've, you've watched Pirates of the Caribbean, right? <laughs> so you, you kind of get the idea that, that that's a set of pulleys and systems to move all of the sails so that no matter where the wind is, you keep going in the direction that you want to go in, okay? So... That's called the tackle. They threw it overboard. You're like, that's how you get where you're going. You're out at sea, you're being driven along, and you're trying to direct where you're going, and finally just take the, the, the compass and go, bloop. Well, good luck. That's what they've thrown overboard. That's why when Paul, or when Luke says this, Luke, by the way, on the boat with Paul to, to go to Rome, Facing Roman authorities, he might end up, as many of the others who are with him that are other criminals, he might end up in an arena until he's dead. That's what a lot of them are going to end up, back in Rome. He doesn't know what waits him there. Neither does Luke, the doctor, who accompanies him on this trip at risk of his own life. Neither does Aristarchus, his friend, who goes to meet his needs and sees that he needs people with him on this terrible journey. Those are great friends. But he says, Luke says, they threw the tackle over with their own hands. I mean, that's like just driving down the interstate, pulling off the steering wheel and throwing it out the window with your own hands. Good luck. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. Just, I don't really like the term, no small storm. Since a ridiculous storm was assailing them. Small storm makes you think, oh, it's tiny, no small storm. And in your brain, you heard small storm. This is not a small storm. This is a hurricane at sea, and they're caught in it. When they had gone a long time without food, and then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice <laughs> and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Uh, in short, I told you so. Yet now, I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me, saying, don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. 
Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on a certain island. But when the fourteenth night came, as we were being driven along in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings, and they found it to be 20 fathoms, like 120 feet. And a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be about 15 fathoms, around 90 feet. So that's gone from 120 to 90. So they are approaching land. Fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern, and they just prayed for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship, and had let down the ship's boat into the sea, the lifeboat, on the pretense of pretending that they were laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion, Julius, and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves can't be saved. So then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's lifeboat, and they let it fall away. Tackle, cargo, food, lifeboat. <laughs> Nothing left, man. You, this thing's just going to go where it goes, and good luck. Until the day, verse 33, was about to be dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. That's a pretty bold statement considering the planes going down. Having said this, he took bread, he gave thanks to God in presence of all of them, and he broke it and he began to eat. And all of them were encouraged and they themselves also took food. Quick, just a little side note, just commercial. When you go out with your family in your restaurant and you pray before you eat, it is a powerful and significant evangelism tool. It lets other people see, one, you're not afraid to be who you are. Two, it lets other people see that this matters to you enough to be who you are in a place that they know they themselves might not agree with it. But thirdly, to sit down and have a meal with people, it's a spiritual thing. And Jesus used this tool over and over and over and over. We should use it more as a body. It's, it's vital. It's vital to sit down and eat together, pray, invite God into the night, and then do whatever you're doing. It's big. It sets the table, literally. He does it, and then all these people who are ignoring everything you said until they're about to die, and now they're listening intently. Amen. Now, who's running the show right now? The pilot? The co-pilot? Julius, the centurion? No. He said, do this, do that, do this. And they are listening to him now. That would have been great back at Crete. But, you know, now they're paying attention. All of them, verse 36, were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons, and he just told them all, not even a hair. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat. <laughs> now the last of our food. Bleep. Like the tea party. When, they, when day came, they could not recognize the land. But they did observe a bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, meaning they cut them loose, they left them in the sea while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders. And hoisting the foresail to the wind, they were heading for the beach. They have now lost their last bit of directionality. They've lost their last tiny fragment of control over this ship over where their next step goes in life, they just threw the rest of it out. It is now just a complete and utter trust in what Paul said God was going to do. 
41. I'm sorry. No, that's right. So they're heading for the beach, 41. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to be broken apart by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none of them would swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, wow, kept them from their intention and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. That, <laughs> this, is, this feels like a horrible plan. The boat is being bashed to bits by the waves. The boat is. Jump in that. It, it's ripping the boat apart. Yeah, but this is your last shot, man. <laughs> you won't have anything to stand on in just a second. This is, you know, you ever see those movies where you're running and what's behind you is falling? What you've been running on is just falling away? That's them running to the front of the boat. You might as well jump, man. There's nothing left. Wanting to keep Paul safely alive, he tells them, just jump overboard first and get to land in 44, and the rest should follow, some on planks, others on various floating things from the ship. And so it happened that they were all brought safely to land. They're landing at this island called Malta. They've never been there. They don't even know. This scene is wild. Not just because a hurricane came. They could have actually should have expected that. They were, they, were, they were taken off at a time when this stuff happens. But that's not the worst of it. They were blazing a trail where God told them not to go. That's why the hurricane came. They were blazing a trail right into the heart of where God said don't. Don't go there. And they did anyway. You know, the, the title, can you pull that up one more? It was kind of a long one. Sorry, Ryan. I'm going to have to work you a little bit today. Uh, ever completely ignore God's direction and just go your own way? I mean, raise your hand if you've done it. A few liars. Most of you are truthful. Yeah. Uh, me too. Me too. Clear direction from God. Mm. God so clear, clearly told me not to take this one job at this one school, but I wanted it, and I knew he told me clearly don't take that job. And it was the worst thing I've ever done. Um, and then about four months later, God freed me from that by his awesome, amazing grace and I wished I'd never taken it, and I still get shudders when I think of that little window of life, but it was just like it was so bad. And I learned why you listen and don't ignore when God gives you a flaming no. But you want it. But you want it. See, several things happen. Several things happen. First, they get on the boat. Paul's on the boat. They're on the way. His buddies are with him. It's, it's really cool that these guys are risking their lives with him. Julius has favor for him. He even allows his friends to take care of his needs. There's another reason for that, by the way. One, Paul's a Roman citizen, and probably not all of them are. Two, Paul isn't yet accused. He's awaiting trial. So he's a Roman citizen awaiting trial. He's supposed to make it, so Julius has to make sure he makes it life for life. So Julius has favor for him because of the kind of man he is, because he can see he's not even guilty, and also because it's his neck if he doesn't make it. Some of these prisoners are already accused. They're going to die in the arena anyway, so they'll just die. That's okay, but we can't lose Paul. But it's already becoming a mess. They're, they're trying to get 
they, they barely make it to Crete. They're trying to go around Crete. Crete's this island. They can't get to the other side of Crete. It's slow. It's difficult. It's rough. It's getting later in the season. And they say this strange thing. They land at something called Fair Havens. That sounds like a nice place, doesn't it? One place in Florida is called Winter Haven. Makes sense. Good place to visit in the winter up here. You want a little winter haven? Go down to Florida once they clean it up. This situation of it is hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's difficulty, we're having difficulty traveling this direction. That often happens when you're completely ignoring God and you're going your own way and little things come up to kind of block your ways, giving you some speed bumps to give you a chance to reconcile. To maybe repent, to turn the other way, yeah, turn, repent, turn around, you're going the wrong way. Or at least stop and wait and talk to them and figure out, okay, why is this so hard right now? Might be that it's just hard. Might be because you're not listening. Many times it's because we're not listening. And so, here they are, here they are, here they are, fair havens. They got a decision to make. It has become late in the year. They're approaching November now, and this is a no-no to travel from here. And the pilot, and he, and, and instead of just making a decision, because it's, you know, it's on him, he's the one deciding, can we make it? He has all of his sailors take a vote. Well, let's vote. Who wants to risk our lives and go to the next port? Or, because it's a better place, it's a more suitable place to, to weather the winter in. It's, it's more suitable for winter. They found their current place, Fair Havens, unsuitable for winter. That's what they said. So they don't like where they are. So we're going to try to go a little bit further in the wrong direction in hopes this might turn out better. That's what they're doing. They're at Fair Havens. Take a vote. Paul says, guys, I can see we're all going to die. How about we don't do this? But the vote comes in. Remember, what, remember the bumper sticker I told you? Never underestimate the power of a whole bunch of stupid people that think the same exact thing. Never underestimate that because there's a lot of power in it. And so they vote, yep, we should move on. Well, we got this prophet from God, this apostle guy that talks, you know, he's, it sounds like he talks to God. Yeah, forget him. Let's go. And they get on the boat and they go. And Paul can't say anything about it. No one's listening to him right now. Here's... Here's the problem, and here's where some of you are today. I can guarantee it, or God wouldn't have laid this on my heart like this. We get to places where God begins to challenge us to take a new direction. We don't want it. It's not suitable for this season of our life. It's not suitable. I don't want this, God. I don't want it. And you can feel him tugging at you. I need you to move in this direction. Life's getting a little harder because he wants you to go in that direction and you're resisting it. And he's like, no, no, you need to do this. It's important. Sometimes it's as simple as changing a diet or getting more movement. Sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes it's, this is an unsuitable season in my marriage. I don't want to be in it anymore. I don't want to fight for this anymore. We, we argue too much. It's too much of a mess. I'm, I'm kind of done with this. So I'm out. This is an unsuitable situation. I was, I, I, I said, I know I said I'm going to stop drinking. But every day it just keeps, like, I'm thirsting for it. My flesh is screaming for it. It's an unsuitable harbor. And every time I've done it, it got a little harder. It got a little harder. My life got a little worse. I lose more of the cargo. I'm throwing off the tackle. I'm losing direction. But I just keep doing it. It's unsuitable. It's unsuitable to fight anymore. I don't like this season in my life, God. So I know that you're telling me to stay here and winter here. But I'm looking around thinking there's better spots than this one. I've had enough of this one. It might be that he's asking you to forgive someone that you hate. And you're carrying around that hate. And you're carrying around that hate. And you're carrying it. It's getting heavier. And it's getting heavier. And it's getting heavier. And you keep carrying it. He's like, I want you to forgive. If you don't forgive, it's only going to get heavier. And I, can, I can free you from it. I can take that away. There's so many things in our lives that feel unsuitable. 
When they're unsuitable because they don't line up with the word of God, okay, move on. But when you can find all kinds of things in the word that say you should stay in this season even though you don't like it, and you're willing to risk the hurricane of not following God's will, that's a dangerous place. I know some of you are there. I know some of you are there. And when we get to the end of this message and we pull back up to play worship, I am begging you, this is an altar and it's a suitable harbor. Take that time, to, not for the band, not for the, not for the show, not for somebody else, for you. For, for hearing from God, come up to the altar and just look for an answer from him. Should I stay in this harbor? If you can't find it in his word, the answer is already no. If it doesn't line up with his word, it's already no. But he can give you the strength to get out of it. If the answer is, in his word, there is a reason to stay in this marriage, which there is, by the way. If there's a reason to fight your flesh with this addiction that keeps crying out inside of you, which there is, by the way. It's an idol. It's taking God's spot. It's giving you the feelings that you're hoping God would give you, but they're lies. They're ripping your tackle away. They're ripping your directionality out of your life. They're ripping your navigation tools away, and they are just throwing you into the storm, and there will be great loss of life and cargo. It's not something that you can just barter with. You can for a little while as you're going along Crete and it keeps getting more difficult. You can barter for a little while with God, but because he loves you so much, he's not going to allow you to keep bartering forever. And if you are blatantly just putting a fist up and you're sailing, <laughs> sail. If that's what you're doing, you don't know where that grace line is. Be careful not to cross it. Grace is a powerful, 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 godly, awesome trait. But treating God with zero respect is a horrible human trait. So, they go on. They, they vote, they go on. And they decide, let's, let's just take our chances. This is an unsuitable harbor. I'm tired of this. Too many times, people in our lives, too many times, I'm tired of this situation. Are you even listening, God? And we're just, we're kicking against the goads to take from last chapter. Kicking against the pointy cactus. We're kicking against something that's only going to hurt us. So they go, and, and, and this this. This scenario starts to feel like, because here's the thing. Some of you already left Fair Havens. <laughs> the hurricane's raging. You left Fair Havens. You ignored him. You knew he was speaking, and you just went anyway. You already know. Yeah, that's where I am, man. Wow. That's where I am. I'm sitting here because I have no idea what to do next. I've thrown out the ship's tackle. I've thrown out my food. I've thrown out the lifeboat. I don't know what to do. Some of you know people here that are right there. So you start to feel like, I've been here four times. I've been here five times. I've listened to the gospel. I never accept Jesus. I, it, it, it moves on my heart, and then I'm like, nah, I got to leave, and I just start living my life again and forget that I'm eternal. Uh, we, 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 you know, get the same kind of warnings. How many times do you speed by a police officer, and he doesn't do it this time? He's on his phone, or there's someone. One time was real close. He pulled out where I'm going, but this guy was a little faster because I pulled off. <laughs> and he's like, Zzz. like, well, that's too bad. He got pulled over. Then you speed again like an idiot. 
Like, like, where's the grace line? You'll find out when you're paying a $350 ticket and appearing at court. The thing is, we get away with it a few times. We think, oh, I'll probably keep getting away with it. But the Northeaster's coming. You're New Englanders. You know that. The Northeaster's coming. So you feel like it's over. I know so many people, they've thrown their hands up and they just run headlong into the sin now because well, I gave up, I blew it. So there's no turning around. So I guess I might as well just keep drinking. Might as well just keep using. Might as well just get into 15 more quick, immoral sexual relationships because I got divorced when God told me to stay in it. Now I'm just kind of playing around, playing the field because I don't know, I'm, I'm out here now. Now, now the Northeaster's striking. Success breeds success, but sin breeds sin. Failure breeds more failure if you allow it. There has to come a time. It's simply, the word is repent, turn around. Turn around and go the other way. Go back to Fair Havens, tough that out with God. He'll give you the strength you need till the storm has passed, until winter season where it's colder and it's darker and you're really not hearing him as much and you're not seeing as much daylight and you're frustrated where you are, but God has you there for a reason so you have strength to face the addiction, strength to face this marriage, strength to fight for another day, strength and and alertness to be aware of your sins so you don't just keep taking chances. If you fight at Fair Havens, you avoid the Northeaster. God's doing something there. That tougher season in your life is for a reason. It's a season with a reason. Let him move. Let him him change you. But we don't change easy. Do you? I don't change easy. My kids don't change easy. I don't change easy. It takes some hits. It takes some knocks. It takes the worst job I've ever had that made me question everything about myself. It takes those to build in you what needs to be there for what he's going to do next. Run away from the season at Fair Havens because it's unsuitable for you and you won't be ready for the storm that's coming. So, here they are. Paul's saying, told you so. <laughs> no one likes that. <laughs> you know, no one likes that. So he doesn't stay there long, but he does remind them. I think I would too, because I'm on the ship and I got no choice. Remember guys, when you guys voted and I said that's a bad idea? That was me. It's a bad idea. But then he says, not one of you is going to lose a hair on your head if you follow these instructions. He doesn't say to them just blindly, not, none of you is going to die. When those sailors go to cut the lifeboat, says they do that, you're all dead. So there's some contingencies to this salvation plan. There's some contingencies to everyone getting on the island, getting off the boat, getting out of the storm. Obedience is the contingency. It's all or nothing. You all go or you all die. Those sailors are trying to get away, Julius. Chop, chop. Goodbye, lifeboat. He's going to kill some of the soldiers, uh, some of the other prisoners. Nope. If some die, we all die. Follow God's direction. I don't know why he said he'd give me all of you. I don't even want all of you. (laughs) Here's a gift. Everyone with you is going to live. Actually, if I swam ashore alone with Luke and Aristarchus, we'd be pretty happy. But it's not true. You've got to, if God comes and talks to you alone, and he says, I'm going to give this desire of your heart to you. He's, it's just you and him. Nobody else was talking. Nobody else knows he was talking to an angel. So why is God going to say some dumb thing that Paul doesn't care about? Paul actually does want the 275 others to live. Or God wouldn't have said, I'm going to give you this gift. He wants him to. He spends his whole life ministering to people. He doesn't want them to die. Even when they're beating on him, he goes back into town and preaches to them. He wants them to live and live forever. Not just live today. 
live in heaven with him and not go to hell because they rejected Jesus. He wants them to know who Christ is and he wants them to know it before they're dead. So they can live. Now and then. So God says to him, I'm going to give you a gift. It's the lives of all the others. And that matters to him. Got to matter more to us. But he's in a storm with all of them. And a lot of them, said, it said so clearly, it said after being two weeks at sea and they couldn't tell day from night because it never stopped being dark and stormy and wavy and windy and raining. Point. They've looped ropes around the stern to keep the thing together while it's bobbing out there. It's a bad, bad storm. And they all, it said they all gave up hope. Any hope of survival. That's where you're really deep in sin. You're just like, I give up all hope. It doesn't matter which side's up, which side's down. I've already blown it. It's over. That is a lie from hell. What's the prodigal son if it's all over? What's the prodigal son that says, Dad, you're dead to me. Can I have your inheritance? I know you're alive, but I want your inheritance. And goes and spends it all with prostitutes and partying. And ends up with nothing. And he's so sad and he's so embarrassed. And he feels like such a fool. And he's on his way home and God meets him first. What's the prodigal son? Why is that even there in Luke? What's the apostles at the Last Supper arguing who's the greatest while Jesus is about to die for their sins? What's that? Over and over in Scripture, you find people who are willing to repent. What's Paul? What's Paul himself killing every Christian he could find, going town to town, putting them in jail, getting permission to hurt? Breathing out murderous threats when Christ saved him. He was a man full of hatred when Christ saved him. If if, if it's already too late, I've already blown it. Why does God give us these examples all through the word? What's David and Bathsheba? Boy, did he screw up. And still God says all through his word, he's a man after my own heart. Because he was after God's heart and he repented. We're going to screw up, people. We're going to screw up as Christians. We're going to screw up while leading ministries. We're going to do things so, so wrong and it's not over. It's only over when you give up. It's only over when you turn away from God and say, I'm done. That's when for you at that moment it's over, but it's not over for him. If you're still breathing, he will come like a pit bull. He won't give up. He won't. Storms raging. They've done it. They've thrown out their tackle. They threw out the lifeboat. But I'll tell you this, that actually is right where God wants them. This is right where he needs them. It had to get this messy for them to finally listen. It had to get this messy. Now, when it gets that messy, and they hit the, the, the sandbar, bottom of the ship, and it's just a churning mesh, mess, and God, God says, Paul, tell them, jump. Yeah, well, actually, it's, it's the Romans' plan. It's Julius. God tells him they all got to do the same thing, tells Paul that. Paul tells that to Julius. Julius says, well, then jump in the lake. Good luck. The ones that can't swim, grab something that floats. That's pretty good advice. I think they're already thinking that. (laughs) Thanks, Captain Obvious. I was looking for floating pieces of the ship. You just cut off the lifeboat. You know, (laughs) I'm definitely looking for floating things, you know. Uh, So so they, they, at this point as they hit the sandbar and they have thrown away all their navigation tools, they've got one last little trick. They've got, they've got, they've, well, at this point, they hadn't left the lifeboat yet. That's when the sailors decided for the lifeboat because they might make it to land in it. 
at that last place where the boat is smashing to bits and death is imminent, they cut out the lifeboat and they undo the rudders. Well, right before the sandbar, they undo the rudders. They're giving up every last bastion of control of their lives and trusting in the direction that God gave them. They're, they're throwing away every navigation tool now, not for their own purposes, not for their own flesh, for God. You ever have God make you cut the, the lines to the lifeboat? The thing, okay, God, I am going to do what you say, but I'm holding this lifeboat over here so I can jump if necessary. Uh, I am holding the rudders in a certain direction. I know you said you want me over here, but I'm holding the rudders in this direction just in case I got to shift gears. You ever do those kind of partial obedience is disobedience, just so we're clear. You know, I've said it before. Partial obedience is disobedience. Mow half the lawn for your dad. (laughs) Then go play basketball. I've heard that's not a good thing to do. (laughs) You can get in trouble for that. Partial obedience is disobedience. You didn't do what you were asked to do. You did a little bit of it. God works the same way. You want the freedom that he offers? Full obedience. Cut the lifeboat that you are holding on to to keep you from doing his will if you should need it. Cut the rudders. Let God steer. I said this once before, but I'm going to repeat it because it's, it's necessary and I want to make sure we have time to, to do the worship. Uh, when I went to Oklahoma and Andy brought me to the, to the journeys thing, which I was so touched by, you all were experiencing a, a Northeaster. I escaped it. I was lying in the grass in the sun and sending videos to mock all my friends. <laughs> having this great time and just enjoying every moment and just thinking, oh, it was, I was really, really impressed with everything that was happening. But this last guy, his name was Henry, Pastor Henry. He came out, he's from Costa Rica, and oh, did he floor me. I left there crying like a little baby. I just didn't see it coming. But when he said that God spoke to him to... to He had it in his heart that he's probably going to have to leave his ministry and do this other thing. I was wondering kind of where God wanted him. And he goes on this retreat, and he's just listening to God's directions. And God says, I want you in that river. He's just out in the woods in Costa Rica. So I should say jungle. And he gets in the water, and he's, in his, he's up to his ankles. And God says, no, no, deeper. And he goes to his knees, a deeper. He's at his waist. The water's kind of strong. It's like deeper. He said, then this thing takes me, and I'm just floating down the river, not sure where it's going to go, not, not knowing what my destination is. And you feel like God said, as he's scrambling for life, God says, now you're where I want you. <laughs> that's, that's where I want you. Do you understand? And he went home and changed direction in his career. And I'm just sitting there just crying. I just didn't see this coming. I'm laughing. He's funny. We're just listening to him. And then that point just hit me with such force. I want you in the flow of my will. And it's probably going to be against the flow of your decision making. So understand that. You might not want to harbor here where the thing's just floating you along. You don't know your destination. Did you hear the point in the chapter where it said the sailors had never seen this land before? Of course they haven't. It's not, a, it's not on their destination chart. They don't care about Malta. But God does. And as God's got a whole bunch of people on that island he's going to save because he's dropping Paul on it to preach the gospel. God's going to take you to Malta sometimes. He's going to get you out of a storm, and he's going to say, cut the lifeboat. Cut the things you're holding on to that aren't me. I'm going to direct the, the, the course of your life, and I'm going to storm you right to the place I want you to land. Trust me. Trust me. 
I hope this rings true. I felt like the Lord really had it for us today. So I brought my floral and butterfly Bible to make sure I landed the point correctly. I love that. Thank you so much. I'm going to keep it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I didn't bring my phone, so I, I understand. I'm going to call the worship team back up. We won't be at this for a super long time, so if you're sitting there debating, I wonder if I should think about what he just said. Don't. Just let the flow of the Holy Spirit bring you to where he wants you to land. This is Malta today. It's not because these steps have some magical property. Oh, I can hear God better. Wow. That's not what happens. It's getting on your knees before God and not being afraid to do it in a public place. There's power in it. Let God take you to Malta and then speak to your heart as you're in the flow of his will. That's all. You see someone up there, pray 